Welcome and thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Day of Empathy here in Michigan. The Day of Empathy is an annual event raising up the voices of people impacted by our criminal justice system. Everyone at Safe and Just Michigan is thrilled you're participating. We've muted your microphones to ensure that everyone can hear the panel, but you can ask questions using the chat function on Zoom. At the end of every panel, we will answer questions for as long as time allows. We wanna thank each of our co-sponsors for helping us get the news out about this event and about the changes in this event from an in-person to a virtual event. Our national co-sponsors Cut50, AFSC Michigan Criminal Justice Program, Arrow, Citizens for Prison Reform, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, Michigan Center for Youth Justice, Michigan Faith in Action, Nation Outside, Still Standing Against Domestic Violence, University of Michigan Carceral State Project, and the University of Michigan Prison Creative Arts Project. For those of you who want to revisit this discussion, we are streaming this event on Safe and Just Michigan's Facebook page through Facebook Live. And you can engage with other people all across the country all day by engaging with the hashtags Day of Empathy and Empathy365 on social media. Let me introduce now Natalie Holbrook. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for participating in this Zoom live stream lobby day. Um, we're very excited to, to be here and to have you um, participate. So we have a wonderful panel today. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the slides because I cannot, um, but hopefully you can. We have some slides that we'll be showing throughout. Um, I have Senator Erica Geis, who is going to be presenting today, Sawatu Salama Ra, who is an activist in Detroit and also experienced incarceration, and Ashley Scott, who was um, is an activist out here now and very much involved in the creation of Senate Bill 830 and 831, which is what we're going to be talking about today and how we got to Senate Bills 830 and 831, the standards of care um, bills that we are um, talking about. So I just wanted to give you um, a quick overview of the history of this. Um, AFSC advocates for people in prison in Michigan. And when Sawatu Salama Ra ended up incarcerated and unjustly incarcerated, um, she reached out to us and was pregnant inside. And we helped her family and community navigate the problem of prison, the conditions of confinement in prison. And we were working together to try to actually um, make it so that it wasn't just her that would um, be advantaged by the, the changes that we were pushing for, but all of the women who end up in prison who are pregnant. Um, and so that's why we are here today with two bills that Senator Geis has been working on with us for two years. And I am going to um, let Sawatu and Ashley open this up and talk about um, why this legislation is important and way in, in their stories um, from their time when they were incarcerated. So Sawatu, would you like to, to talk now? Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Um, and thank you all for joining um, this very important call in a very in uh, during a very important time. Um, so yeah, like Natalie talked about, um, I found myself um, in prison and incarcerated, seven months pregnant, and I knew very little about the criminal justice system. Um, and as an activist, uh, I have been organizing for the past 15 years around environmental racism and environmental justice, social issues. Um, daughter of a longtime activist and organizer. So like um, it was embedded in my head a young person to, um, to be of service to community and recognize the very issues that um, community suffers from and what it is, what it's gonna take for community um, to themselves and, um, and embody the changes that we want to see as a society. And so um, I know about that, right? I know about um, what community means and the power that people hold. I know about fighting against big corporations and against corporate greed. Um, I, know, I know a lot about that, but I knew a little, only just a tad bit about the criminal injustice system. And so 
I mean, I know we have a, a major issue and problem of mass incarceration. I know that we were incarcerating black and brown people and their families at an alarming and um, horrifying rate. I knew that. I knew that people that I grew up was was disappearing and in, in, into a, into a system um, that was so brutal. I knew that, but I did not know the ins and outs. I didn't know that once you are um, once you have uh, entered the what I call it like the door of no return um, of the criminal injustice system, how greatly it impacts um, your family and your community. Um, and the the horror, horrifying realities of it. So I knew I knew a little about I knew a little of that. So when I found myself in and wrapped up in the system, um, I only knew to do one thing, which was to call on community that um, call on them in a way that they would normally call on me. So it was it was like all right, y'all, like this is what has happened, um, and I need help. Right, I had to plead to my community and say, I need help um, because this is something that's, that, um, that I knew a little about. And once I was convicted, that was it. I had 30 days to surrender my physical body, my pregnant um, physical body to a system that is so brutal. And I had to prepare for that. Um, and so the reality is, is that once you are um, inside of a prison cell or, um, and especially pregnant, the realities of, of prison and, and being pregnant is um, one of the most terrifying realities that I wish for no one, for no one, absolutely. So it consisted of entering of entering um, Huron Valley and going straight to quarantine, that 23 hour lockdown on a pregnant body in a cell. Um, and so that alone you all um, is, is one of, and that's, so it, during quarantine, 23 hour lockdown, that's when I had to realize I had to survive. Like how, how, how am I going to live through this? Um, and so I started to doing things that I knew would work against polluting facilities and fighting against corporate greed. I had to use those same tactics and tools against the prison industrial complex. Um, and so, really that's kind of where I'm coming into this work is like, how did an environmental justice organizer survive the prison? And the way that I made sense of it in my own head of how I survived and, and how I was make it, able to make it through with a piece of my sanity that I hold today um, is by connecting environmental justice to prison abolition. That's how it works in my brain. And so that's what I come to this, um, that's what I bring to you all um, is realizing and is realizing the realities that, first of all, the environmental impact and realities that then lead people of color into prison in the first place. Um, and so that's kind of where, where it happens in my head. But from, I mean, I met Ashley, um, who's also who will speak next. Ashley in quarantine. Ashley was, you know, um, nine months pregnant and I was seven months pregnant. And um, the resilience um, that was particularly held in the pregnant postpartum unit was where I, I realized that this country is, and, and, and its realities is so messed up, y'all, um, that we imprison pregnant people, um, we shackle pregnant people. My mother said, I remember my mother going up to Lansing um, to talk to, um, then Governor Snyder's um, office um, about the shackling. And she told him that if we, it was, she wasn't talking to Governor Snyder, um, but someone from his team. Um, but she told him that if America found out that we were shackling a pregnant dog, then everyone would be in the uproar. But yet we shackle pregnant people we put belly chains around their um, their bellies um, after having C sections, and we we dehumanize them um, on on levels that you cannot even imagine. We send pregnant people to solitary confinement. We 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 house them in in um, 
in facilities that is infested with mold um, and that is so overcrowded that it's ridiculous um, and we sh all should be ashamed of ourselves um, of the realities when it comes to being in prison and so <clears throat> I quickly had to figure out um, what are the best ways to make sure that no person sh goes through this Right. And a lot of a lot of what I went through, I went through not knowing that I was even not like not knowing the policy, not knowing what, what my rights were, um, not knowing what what um, what opportunities I had. I did. You know, I, I all I knew was to. Tell my community. Speak about what I saw, speak about what had happened to me, um, speak to the other women about their own stories and try to get those stories outside of the prisons outside of the prison walls to community who had the power and ability to uplift that story and get the attention that it needed and to mobilize power um, and advocate for change. And, um, and that's kind of the work of the freedom team and, mm -hmm. and our, um, the thing that we give. And so this whole, this whole process has been nothing but magical um, to find myself in prison to meet some of the most, the world's most amazing people. I find it very ironic that the, the, some of the world's most amazing people are in prison. And that also says a lot about us and who we are, that we imprison some of our, um, our most amazing people. Um, and so, yeah, um, you know, to have Senator Erica Geist support and I mean, just overall, um, um, excellence and, and, and love and, and, um, and making sure that she has listened greatly to our stories, stories of pain. Um, this is, this um, whole process has, I don't know how much time I have. I don't, I know. I, so I don't want to, um, just keep talking, but, um, also open for questions so that it feels. Yeah. And so Watu, we're going to do questions at the end. Um, cool. And and we're also I'm Ashley. If you would like to um, give some overview now, also um, we finally we've got the slides up here. I think can folks see them? Just thumbs up. Can you yeah. see them on your screen? Okay, cool, wonderful. Um, and so this is in in this slide presentation. There's a lot of embedded information, and we're gonna um, end up making sure you all have it so that you can act on um, a call to action at the end to contact members of the Senate Judiciary um, Committee. Um, and, and so that is um, gonna be our call to action, but there's a lot of information embedded in here and we'll make sure to go over as much of it as we can in this short time we have together. So Ashley, if you would like to give us um, some reflections on how, you know, why it's so important that we create um, standards of care for women inside across the board, but preg pregnant women in particular and have oversight in the prisons. Um, please, it's your turn to talk. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Um, everybody, I'm so grateful to be here and I'm so thankful that everybody is here with us joining. Um, so, you know, like Sawatu said, um, I went to prison when I was um, nearly nine months pregnant. Um, I was very naive. I have had loved ones who have been affected by the criminal justice system, but I was personally never affected. Um, so when I got there pregnant, it was very apparent to me early on that I was not going to be welcomed with compassion. I was not going to be treated differently. I knew that I was the only one who was going to care enough about my unborn child to protect myself and protect my baby. Um, so, you know, for me, that meant walking around with my arms crossed around my stomach. And so after quarantine, entering the pregnant postpartum unit, uh, you're surrounded with women who are experiencing the same things you are and it's just a whirlwind of emotions uh you hear a lot of people talk about um they did they're not doing this for me i i i can't get the medical care i need i i wish they would change this i wish they would do this but nobody feels as though their voice is relevant they you kind of just are at the mercy of the system so you 
just go through the motions and just hope and pray that you're going to be safe, that your child is going to be healthy and you know, that they're going to provide you with the care that you need, um, during your delicate state of pregnancy. And so, um, I personally was, um, during my pregnancy, I was attacked with threats from, you know, um, the state as well, because I didn't have family in Michigan. Um, and as, as much as we tried to develop a plan for somebody to pick my son up from the hospital, um, you know, the state did not allow that. So when my five minutes before I left the hospital, uh, they told me my son was going to go to foster care and going back to the prison. Um, <clears throat> I just remember yearning so much for my child and being in so much pain. And, um, I remember Sawatu being there, you know, for me every day, um, you know, constantly giving me hope, telling me, Ashley, he's coming home. Don't worry. Things are going to change. You know, this, this, this is a dying system and, you know, just, just keep pushing forward. Um, so when I was released, uh, it was, it was very, it became such a burning desire for me to make sure that other women did not experience the same thing that I did. And, um, you know, I think that these bills demand improvement with standards of care for the women, uh, especially the pregnant women. And I think the oversight is imperative because it gives people the opportunity to use their voice um, who didn't feel like they could use their voice before. And there's so many changes um, and improvements that need to be made. And I think this is just the first step. And again, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so now that we have these slides up, if Jack, if you could get to the, um, the no, all the no's that we've been given. The reason that we um, are actually even here now is that we had been advocating for the department to do a lot of um, the changes that they could have done to make it so that they don't shackle people, um, women when they're taking them to the hospital. Um, and and when they've, they do not shackle during birth, but to shackle right after they've given birth. Um, and we were told no that they wouldn't make that policy change. We were told no, that they wouldn't allow women to breastfeed inside um, once they've given birth. We were told no, that there's not gonna be a mandated 72 hours um, where they're going to allow a woman to be with her infant. So we got all of these no's um, and then legislators got these no's also. Um, Senator Chang, Senator Geis, um, Representative Warren, and so, Senator Geis took up the, the really um, long struggle to make this legislated so that the department has to do the things that we were asking all along. And um, she is going to go into some overview of why she cares about this and what this bill covers right now. So Senator Geis, thank you so much for your um, attention to this matter and for being a people's legislator because you are completely amazing um, and I adore you. So um, here she is now to, to talk about this bill and her motivation for being involved in it. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thanks, Natalie and uh, Sawatu and Ashley and everyone who has been a part of this really long journey. Um, the, you know, it's, it's really hard to like to, to quantify why um, I was motivated to care. And I, I kind of feel like it's one of those, those questions like that is like, how could you not is the answer. Um, the, the, one of the sad things to me in our conversations um, over the past two years with, with some of the folks at MDOC, um, the Department of Corrections, especially when we were talking about some, some basic human needs was their resistance and their um, overly punitive 
attitude. Um, you know, obviously the, they, they are part of the correction system, but the fact that they somehow forgot about the humanity of the individuals who are there to, um, as a response to violating some statute in MCL, um, somehow strips them of humanity is just unconscionable to me. Um, and so that's part of why I got involved. Um, one of the first things when I was first elected, um, actually before our first session day, um, I was with Senator, with, uh, so then Representative Chang and I, when we were representatives um, in the House, um, and two of our other colleagues um, went um, to, uh, to visit uh, women's here on Valley. And we, we were with, um, I remember the date, it was January 6th of, of uh, 2015. Um, um, and we went to go hear the, speak with and hear the stories of some of the, the lifers. And it really impressed upon me a lot of the, the holes in the system, a lot of the injustices. And, and I, I can't echo more um, Sawatu sentiment, which he called it the criminal injustice system, um, that um, mm. that women especially face, um, and so that's always left an indelible um, impression on my mind. And then the other things that have been um, occurring at Women's Here on Valley that we've heard in the news. Um, from issues of overcrowding to the the health issues with with um, with scabies, um, you know, those are just the things that made it to to our news outlets, as opposed to the issues that the women in there are dealing with every day. And you know, you add Sawatu's story. If it weren't for the fact that Sawatu had such a strong network of people behind her, um, I'm not sure that her story. Um, would have become public um, in the way that it did. And the, um, the, the issues that persist at the women's prison um, that further harm and further strip the, the women prisoners um, of just their basic humanity is what we need to stop doing. And to compound that, by further harming pregnant prisoners um, and their their um, their babies um, is unconscionable. So we need to make sure that we are protecting this ultra vulnerable group um, and making sure that they are able to deliver safely, that they are able to nurture their infants safely, um, that they are able to get them to. Um, to family who can care for them, that they are able to have those bonds um, with their family members um, so that we're not creating intergenerational trauma. Um, and that's, that's part of why Senator Chang and I have been so deeply um, invested in this. As a, as a mom, um, when I hear about the, 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 the practices um, that occur for uh, for pregnant de in delivery and postpartum mothers, I, I'm just I'm just floored um, because I know what it's like to go through labor and delivery. So from an empathetic uh, place, I know that that is what the women who are delivering there are going through is just flat out wrong, um, and we need to stop it. And so I'm very glad that we were able to get these bills to a space where um, they could be introduced and where the um, they're going to an actual committee, not the committee um, that bills go to die in. So they've been referred to judiciary and that the share of judiciary is interested in, um, in having hearings on them. Um, so I'm very hopeful that we will see progress made. Um, and the, so one of the bills specifically addresses um, pregnancy in prison and the standards of care in that Senate Bill 830, which you see up there um, on the PowerPoint. But then we also have an additional piece, which is Senate Bill 831, that covers um, a 
a, um, a panel, not, not a panel, a, co uh, a committee that is an oversight committee so that there's additional oversight um, for women's here on Valley and that we, um, with people who are um, advocates and professionals um, who can make sure that there are additional set of eyes and ears um, on what's going on at the prison and making sure that there's additional measures of accountability. And they would work with the corrections ombudsman. Thank you, Senator Geis. Ashley, would you please um, let this group of folks know what it's meant to you to get involved in this sort of civic engagement and, um, and what, you, what it's meant to you um, to be involved from the get-go on getting a, a two bills crafted, on being really there for all of the calls and being a stakeholder in this. What has it meant to you and why do you think it's so important that people who've actually lived experience um, are involved in the creation of legislation? Um, <clears throat> so I think that it's, to me, it's very dear to me because of my livable experience um, and what I witnessed um, during my time incarcerated. I um, genuinely hurt and was in pain for the women who I watched come back from having, you know, delivered a child and coming back to, you know, a facility built on a foundation of oppression. Um, it, it just, I, I've always had a desire um, to see changes made um, in our communities for several different issues. And this is, because of my story, I've been given the opportunity to use my voice. And I think, you know, I've, I've had other women reach out to me um, who, you know, saw social media from the press conference who were just, you know, commending us in legislation and, and Senator Erica Geis for, you know, moving forward and, and not, um, you know, just overlooking these issues because it's, it's just, it's so important. Um, these women are human beings. Um, they don't deserve to be treated the way they're being treated. Everybody should have the opportunity to be surrounded by community and love when they give birth. It's a very, very intimate moment. Um, and, you know, I think that with civic engagement, it is our duty um, to do the things that we can do, whether that be signing petitions, um, joining meetings like we are today, um, you know, testifying with our own stories. It's, to me, it's just, um, it's, it's, the, it's the least I feel like I can do. Um, because unfortunately, you know, these things are still happening every single day in women's here on Valley. And I just, um, have an overwhelming um, passion for this work. And I just am, am so grateful for SWATU and the Freedom Team for allowing me to join forces with them and use my story. So, Thanks, Ashley. And I want to pivot from that um, because the work of the Freedom Team is really powerful and um, rooted in a space of love. Um, and of really being inclusive of all of the voices of people who are impacted and then also people who might need some education around what prison is um, and what a world without prisons might look like. And so Suwatu, I'm gonna ask you to just, um, if you could put out there like that we we're talking about this abolitionist perspective and I think this got like sort of born in your heart because you know that we can make these changes and we can stop shackling and allow women to breastfeed and have oversight at the women's prison. But what would it ultimately look like if we didn't send women, pregnant women or caregivers of kids, because a lot of these women are actually parents, um, to prison at all? And so could you just real briefly just give us some insight into that, this sort of visioning that we've done with the Freedom Team um, for Toward a World Without Prisons? Yeah, I'll try my best. Um, 
And be, because um, the Freedom Team, now the Freedom Team is a uh, volunteer defen defense committee uh, and participatory um, group that has uh, made it their business to, to um, find out the intersectional uh, realities between environmental justice and prison abolition. And so we had one goal. The first goal was, was that I was wrongly convicted and to get me out. But then also I was like, you don't see you don't see often the type of um, community mobilization that the freedom team was able to do often and so since we got everybody together how about we also change the world and so that's kind of um that's been the primary um feeling and vision of the freedom team and its power and so as a as an organizer um i know all about the re First of all, as an organizer, your work is always in demand because there's always something to fix. And we know a lot about crisis and we internalize crisis. We know how to show up and, and organize around, right? We, it's, it's, it's throughout history, you have seen many different movements um, that has affected all of our lives, to, right? We, we, it, whether it was about housing, food, education, um, so the civil rights movement, you know, the environmental justice movement, all of it is a reaction from people that says we deserve better as a people. We deserve a better community. We deserve a better, a better planet, you know, and, but it's however you um, identify and what you specifically have to bring towards that movement um, so that um, we all feel included. I mean, our, all of our voices are impacted and, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and that's where you kind of the, the magic happened. And so as a, as a daughter of a mother who grew up in the 50s um, and who often tell me that she's never seen anything like the Freedom Team, people coming together from many different um, areas of justice. So the Freedom Team, can you imagine environmental justice organizers, climate justice organizers, food justice organizers, media justice organizers, um, people who focus on education, um, people who are focusing on um, the illegal um, home foreclosure that's happening in Detroit that literally just um, it was a total um, criminal act of getting six hundred million people, uh, six hundred million dollars um, out of the people to invest in um, infrastructure and development. But m what I'm trying to say is, it was people who did not know about the prisons and 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 the criminal justice system. It, it literally took people from different corners of justice to come together, have one mutual um, goal and an and idea of how we all would benefit from it. And that's imagining a better world. And if we're imagining a better world, then first what we can do is, is attack and dismantle one of, the, one of the strongest forces that it holds, which is the prison industrial complex. Many different realities and, and, and symptoms um, we see today of the prison industrial complex, we're all affected by. And so that was an opportunity and it kind of like this aha, this great um, collective aha moment that people said, this is how you build true capacity and, and, and community. It's by people coming together and no matter what you focus on, no matter if you are interested in water or food or prisons or um, you know, climate. It was that people came together to do one thing. And so um, that has been the, one of the most powerful moments um, that I have recognized throughout this, pro this whole entire process uh, around building power. And so if we can imagine a world 
that is true and free, then we can imagine a world that is free of prisons and, and, and we can, we can um, address our, this, and I get this from Natalie, but our addiction to punitive practices. And, and that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take for unlikely group of allies to come together, finally, to focus on one thing. Um, and then to realize the power that comes from all of us coming together, no matter what, no matter what piece of um, self-identified work you, you hold, and that it holds power to, to work together. So, um, and if we do that, then we can free people from prison. The fact that I was sentenced to a mandatory sentence, I was sentenced to two years in prison, flat. When you, once you are convicted, you are convicted and there's really nothing to get, like there's no way to get out of it, right? And so um, I just want, you, want to echo the, the, the magicalness or the, the extraordinary um, impact of people coming together to focus on these issues um, and what we can do to change it. And so, um, because when you do see people coming together, then you can free people from prison. And there's so many people that I know who are in prison who do not need to be in prison. Who, there are people who are in prison who, can, who just could not afford an attorney. And if I didn't, I, I would still be there if I did not have community to fundraise funds to get me the attorney that I needed to fight to truly fight for my freedom and innocence in the in the uh, the court system, I would still be there, and that is the reality of many of our people and many of our brothers and sisters and siblings that are tangled in the relentless logic of mass incarceration. Um, and so, you know, we we know about organizing and mobilizing. One of those ways was saying like we probably cannot dismantle the prison industrial complex in five, 10, 15, 20, maybe 50 years. But what can, the things that we can do right now are the things that you're seeing right now. It's, it's, it's Bill 830 and 831. And you know, when I'm doing speeches and I'm talking about this, this very thing, what you can almost definitely expect the question of, well, People are in prison for a reason. They did something wrong. Um, it's not a uh, place of compassion, right? It's not a place where you go and get treated well. It's prison. And that's true. You know, that's that. But is it right? No. And so we're going to have to normalize this, conference, this very difficult conversation about what it means, um, what does punishment mean, and its impact on all of our lives all of our lives and if we can move to a very difficult position reality of having true conversations around punishment and and eradicating the idea of what punishment looks like in america could because we have one of the brutal sums in the entire world then we can start to to realize the impact and the generational um impact on people and, and communities because once you are tangled in the system, whether you think that person is, should be in it or not, that increases the likelihood of the system growing and becoming more stronger because it's off of our bodies and bodies. And when our people are suffering, when we don't have access to water, when we, are, when we don't have access to uh, air, when we don't have access to clean uh, air and, and, and food, and we are being ripped of our resources and raped of our assets as a people, we all, we all know about it, right? Then you will see an increase in the criminal injustice system in people, people's bodies and sales. And so that's the reality. And, and that's where um, the Freedom Team um, has vowed to advocate on those intersectional pieces um, and liberating the people who are lost and trapped in this system. Um, we can, we, if, if it's if crime that we want to talk about and, 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 and you know, and because it's, it's really what crime, it's a whole 
misunderstanding around um, what communities believe ar around safe communities um, that fuels the prison's first place. Um, but I believe, and there's much information and stories behind it, is that if we address the front end issues of people, then we can decrease the realities and brutal realities that people face inside the prisons. And just literally having a bill that says, stop shackling people, let a woman breastfeed her baby, um, have community oversight, that is very, it, first of all, it's, it's shameful that we have to put it in, in, um, in legislation, it should already be a thing, but it moves us in the direction of a better world on a larger scale, so yeah. Thanks, Sawatu. Um, I, I do wanna ask Senator Geis another um, question and then we're gonna open it up. We have Q&A coming in from the attendees on Zoom. So I wanna make sure we have time for that. Um, and then we wanna also direct you to all the Twitter handles and the emails of the Judiciary Committee. Um, so Senator Geis, I would like you to just give us some overview of where the bills are right now and where what do we need to do in order to um get them a hearing and get them um passed and if you could just give us that sort of overview and i also realize we're in a very strange time of COVID 19 um and there's like things are are held up right now in terms of committee hearings um and what your take is on that that would be wonderful thank you Thanks, Natalie. Um, so the bills have been referred to the, Judici the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, which is chaired by Senator Pete Lucido. And um, in the conversations that he and Senator Chang and I had with him, he was very interested in, um, in having hearings on them. Um, when I spoke to um, Senate Majority Leader Shirky, um, and asked for them to be directed to judiciary, um, I was pleasantly surprised that they went to judiciary and not to um, another committee. Um, so you can see all of the members there on the PowerPoint of the judiciary of the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, their Twitter handles, and then all of their email addresses are also um, basically it's um, the very, very same formula, but it's SEN and then first initial, last name, and then at senate.michigan, all spelled out, dot gov. Um, and I would urge people to, especially the committee chair um, and the vice chairs to, the, to urge committee hearings, urge scheduling hearings when we're back um, in session after we have um, navigated through the pandemic um, and urge that these bills be taken up. I think anyone who has stories should share their stories, whether you are someone who is form formally incarcerated, the loved one of um, someone who was formerly or is currently incarcerated. These are the stories that need to be amplified um, and need to be um, uplifted so that we can address um, this very critical issue. I think if you are someone who is a doula or otherwise involved in birthing or postpartum care um, and able to talk about the need for proper care of people who are pregnant and giving birth and um, in the postpartum state, that's also helpful. We need all the voices of the, the people who can amplify the need for, um, for this legislation to, um, to support it and to urge hearings. And then when we get a hearing and as soon, you know, as soon as we have that, we'll make sure that the, that the committee, um, that the, the coalition members have that information so it can be amplified um, and sent out to the networks. We need those rooms filled. Um, the, so that's the next step. 
and each step of the way. So there's there are multiple steps for those who aren't familiar with how legislation um, ultimately becomes law. Um, first, you have the commit after introduction, you have the committee hearing and then or hearings. This could take more than one. Um, and after those, if they get favorably passed out of that committee, it goes to the full Senate for, for a floor vote. And once we uh, get through that, and again, I would say, you know, have the same process of reaching out to all of the members of the chamber. Um, and then it goes to the House, to the House Judiciary Committee. Um, thankfully, in the House, when something comes through the Judiciary Committee, it does not need to go through the secondary committee of approval, which is Ways and Means. So if it gets out of Judiciary, um, it then goes to the full House, and then after that to the governor. And each step of the way, we need all the voices and hoping to amplify it um, the, so that we can get it passed. And there will be other similar pieces of legislation that are part of the collective of um, pursuing um, a very different future for um, what the justice system looks like or the injustice system looks like and making changes there. So this is just part of the journey. And for those who can be with us the entire um, sets the entire pathway. Um, we need you um, and we need your energy and your spirit and your activism. So that's where, that's where it goes next. And um, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, you know, the, I trust that the chair, when he says he wants to take it up, um, is willing to do so. Um, but of course, we always we seem to have random stumbling blocks that occur. So we've got the the budget to contend with when we get back, as well as this current hiatus that we're in because of addressing the the, the global pandemic of COVID nineteen. So, um, but I'm also um, committed a thousand percent to seeing this through, whether we get it through this. Um, Mom is on a call, baby. Um, whether we get it through, the joys of working from home with little ones, um, the, whether we get it through this session um, or whether it's next session, but we need to keep pursuing it um, this session. Hopefully I answered all the questions there. Thank you, Senator Geis. Um, so I am gonna just go through some of the questions that have been coming in on the chat. Um, and a couple of them I can answer really quickly. Um, somebody asked if this will impact county jails that it will not. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't work on addressing county jails, um, but this bill is particularly for state prisons. Um, in terms of how many women will give birth at Huron Valley this year, I, I don't have the exact number of women who are pregnant right now at the Valley. Um, I do know that it has gone up over the last many years. Um, sometimes 15 women give birth, sometimes um, even higher than that. And so it's, um, it's, it is a much larger number than in previous years. Um, the, the other, there's a couple of other um, questions about where, uh, what other states are doing and um, 20 other states have better laws than we do right now. But you can also check on um, the Rebecca Project report card and um, see what other states are doing in terms of pregnant women in prison. Um, in terms of the oversight committee, which is a separate bill and will have jurisdiction over the entire prison, um, I don't know of an outside oversight committee that has um, jurisdiction to go into one prison. And so, um, that I, I will do more research to see, but I do know there are um, ombuds people that can investigate prisons and this will be adding resources basically to our ombuds person's office because he's not a doctor and his staff, are, they're not doctors, but this expert advisory committee will have doctor positions on it. It will have sanitation engineers that can go, a sanitation engineer that can go in and see 
about the mold conditions at the prison. Um, it will have a nutritionist who can really check the quality of food that people are being fed. So it is basically for me as an activist who's been doing this work a long time, it's flipping the prisons inside out and re reestablishing it as this public space that it is because it's ours, we fund it, and we need to know what's happening inside and stop the opaqueness and the draconian laws that govern it. Um, do you all, there's a question. So Ash and Sawatu, what kinds of postpartum supplies were you provided um, by the prison when you were inside? Um, well, for me, I was, uh, when I left the hospital, um, the transporting officer uh, would not allow the hospital to provide me with any supplies. Um, and when I got back to the prison, um, I can't remember the exact amount, but I think that I was given a uh, a pack of pads and um, uh, I was not initially given breast pads. Um, I had to wait several days. Um, I was not um, provided with the medication that the hospital prescribed to me when I left. Um, and I also waited, I believe several days to see the doctor after returning. Um, and I think that for me, I think that was all, I think that was all they gave me. Yeah, so like Ashley said, I mean, supplies are very limited. So the, the hospital, you are able to leave the hospital with things. So um, I left the hospital with like a, with the very, Mothers and, and people who have given birth, you know that you need these very long pads um, and like um, the, the, the mesh underwear, um, all of those things that should be standard and um, um, things that you leave from the hospital with, the prison would not allow in. Um, they consider those kinds of things contraband. And so even if it was given to you by the hospital and, and by your doctor. Um, and you have to get what the prison allow you to have, which is less, the quality of those things, those same items are tremendous. And, you know, and so not only is, if, you, if the quality uh, is less, then that means you need more of the product and number. You need, the quantity should be, um, should be what um, makes up for it. And so your women who are giving birth have to, are using less quality and less quantity of the items that they need to properly care for their healing bodies of giving birth. Um, I think we got a pack of pads every, two packs of pads every month. So, you know, that's kind of what I remember. You get the pads, the breast pads I had to beg for. Um, you know, sometimes you just, in reality, beg an officer to allow you to have the mesh panties, which I did, um, and things like that. So, yeah, um, those kinds of items was, you know, that was what it was. Less quantity, less quality. Um, so Natalie is gone. Uh, she Actually, goes. I'm back. She's back. I'm back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I'm getting like dropped here and there. And, um, so it's been a little bit of a struggle for me. Um, I would like to, um, just, we're going to wrap up in just a couple minutes. Um, I, there was a question about pregnant women right now, and I, we got word um, in the chat that they're actually pregnant women have been on the decrease at the women's prison, which 
um, in this moment in time, that's a really wonderful thing. Um, and so I bravo um, to judges who are not sending pregnant women to prison um, because there had been an uptick because judges had been seemingly paternalistic um, in sending them as a safe place to prison. Um, I think I covered most of the questions. I don't know if other ones came in while I was um, getting booted. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if there were more, but what I, we'd like to do now is basically a call to action. We're going to try to show this super quick video. Um, there were a lot of uh, hashtags in this, um, in the presentation we were putting up there. We have this hashtag unshackle pregnant pregnancy. Um, we have a hashtag oversight now. We have um, a really great GIF you can use on social media. Um, my favorite is that uh, prison oversight is a civic duty. Um, I think that if we have more prison oversight, we would um, be able to dismantle prison and the use of prison more readily um, because people would know what's going on in the cages in Michigan. So I want to thank Sawatu and Senator Geis and Ashley for being with us today. And Jack, if you can um, put the, the video on and all of you, um, please be involved in this movement. You can get with us. And our other hashtag is care not confinement. That's a good one too. Um, but you can get with us. And um, we have a great website at afsc.org slash kites that has this video you're about to see. Um, I'm sending you all a lot of peace and love during this strange time um, in COVID-19. I thank Jack and um, Demetrius for being so supportive throughout all of this work. Um, and to all the, the Freedom Team members and all the stakeholders, so many of them have been involved. Thank you very much. And here's the video. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Hey, Jack, can you share the sound for this video? I'm sorry, guys. Is there no sound on the video? No, there wasn't. Can you okay. just restart it real quick, Jack. Yeah. It's now that it's there. Okay. This is literally like the line paper <laughs> that you can only have in a prison. You, you only allowed to have line paper. <laughs> Capture everything. And I can see the pain in my hand. In the prison, you communicate with the administration through kites. You know, so if you need anything, you need a health care, you need to see a therapist, you needed to see the dietitian, you needed to talk to the warrior, which would um you would send a kite. A kite is just a scrap sheet of paper that you rip. You write your message on it, you drop it in the box and hope that it gets to the person you're sending it to. And um, I remember getting hot pink paper and writing urgent in bold letters to the deputy warden who was the overseer of the pregnant and postpartum unit that I was in. And asking her to please consider to come to talk to me um, and telling her that it was urgent. And the reason why I wrote, wrote urgent on it was because I had milk in my breast that I was lit that was leaking through my shirt. And all I wanted to do was just breastfeed my baby when he came to see me. Um, but then I also knew that my milk wouldn't last longer either. Because once you stop breastfeeding, milk goes away. So I put urgent on it. And she did. She came to see me. And, um, 
I tried, I tried to convince this woman to let me and let other women breastfeed our babies when they came to see this. She told me she'll get back with me to see what the warning says. And two days later, she sent the message back to JPEG. She sent her kite back to me through the electronic JPEG. Um, but not only did she send it to me, she sent it to the entire prison um, of them telling me no. Hey, from Just Michigan, Cut 50 and all our co-sponsors, thank you for participating, participating in today's Day of Empathy event. Remember, there is still time for you to sign up for our remaining panels throughout the day. Uh, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice discuss the Day of Empathy at 1 o'clock p.m. Jail's Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration at 3 p.m. We'd like to take a minute to thank our co-sponsors again, our national uh, partner, Cut 50, AFSC Michigan Criminal Justice Program, Aero. Citizens for Prison Reform, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, Michigan Center for Youth Justice, Michigan Faith in Action, Nation Outside, Still Standing Against Domestic Violence, the University of Michigan Carceral State Project, the University of Michigan Prison Creative Arts Project. On the screen, we've included several ways that you can keep in contact with Safe and Just Michigan. We hope you, you will use the hashtags Day of Empathy, Why Empathy, and Empathy365 on social media all day to engage with other people participating in the Day of Empathy across the country. We also hope you'll let us know that you, if you enjoyed the panel, fill out our exit survey at bit.ly M-I, oh sorry, bit.ly slash M-I-D-O-E-S-U-R-V-E-Y. That's bit.ly slash M Michigan, uh, sorry, M-I-D-O-E survey bit.ly m-i-d-o-e survey thanks again for participating in today's panel we hope to see you later this afternoon bye